up to now, I thought bears were not an issue, but I heard from another Tajikistan enthusiast who was basically half attacked by a bear in her tent. So the, the bear got away, but, uh, you know, so I thought always that the, the shepherds were exaggerating when they were talking about bears, but, you know, they are, yeah, they, evidently they are, <laughs> they can be an issue. Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries. In today's episode, we journey to the Central Asian country of Tajikistan with our guest and award-winning author, Jan Bakker. Jan is the author of the guidebook Trekking in Tajikistan and he's here today to talk to us about his vision for the Pamir Trail. The Pamir Trail is a 1000 km hike through the mountainous Pamir region of Tajikistan. And if you stick with us until the end, you'll hear about Jan's recommendation in a regular call to adventure. And in our final Pay It Forward segment, you'll hear Jan talk about a project that's important to him championing women in what is predominantly a male-dominated industry. So whether you're an adventure seeker, a hiker, or looking for something a little bit more challenging and interesting, or just want to get involved in the adventure space, stick with us and enjoy this conversation with Jan Backer. Jan Backer, welcome to the Adventure Diaries. How are you? Uh, thanks, yeah, I'm, I'm very well. Um, just uh, travelled from Europe to Uganda, so um, but I'm recovered and fresh again. So. Uh, yeah good 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 well thanks for for coming on the show so you know and it exchanges the 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 kind of angle and the purpose of today's show is really to talk about your trekking in tajikistan and in particular some of your experiences and the vision that you've got for the pamir trail uh, and the pamir trail project but before we get into that do you want to introduce yourself and give us a little insight into jan Bakker and your background yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name is Jan Bakker. Uh, I'm a Dutch national. I'm from the Netherlands, a very flat country, as you may know. Uh, and that's why Dutch people are always very interested in mountains, because we don't have them. Um, currently, I live in uh, Uganda with my family. I've got two little boys here, uh, and my wife uh, works in international development. Um, I am, yeah, well, how, do, how would I describe myself? I'm, I'm a guidebook author. I wrote uh, Trekking in Tajikistan for uh, Cicerone Press. And uh, I'm an expedition leader for various companies, uh, British and Dutch companies, um, going to some of the beaten track places. Uh, and also work on a project here in Uganda where we uh, train hiking guides in uh, more remote places in uh, Uganda, in Eastern Uganda, where it's yeah quite underdeveloped, the whole... Uh, uh, hiking tourism industry. So, um, and I work for a, a, a booking platform called BookingTracking.com. So, I basically, on a daily basis, I I develop new trips. Uh, I write blog posts about uh, destinations, and um, yeah, that's what I'm. Um, that what that's what keeps me busy. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, <laughs> and then I've got some passion projects as well, of course. What? But I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, a bit later on. Excellent. So why why Tajikistan? And maybe before you answer that, for people that don't and that have never heard of T Tajikistan, can you tell us where it is? So it's in Central Asia um, and it borders um, Afghanistan, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. Um, so it's basically wedged into all these countries, all these stands. Uh, and it's, it's surprisingly, it's not that far. People think it's really far, but it's from, from Istanbul. It's, uh, it's only a five hour flight. So, you know, it's, um, it's very easy to travel to actually. And, um, but yeah, it sounds very far away. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, the reason I found it actually, I was, I was doing some research on, uh, some of the through hikes in the U S and, and particularly some of the Pacific Crest Trail. And then I, that's how I come across the, the, uh, the, the Pamir Trail. And I, I, ha I must admit, I had never heard of Tajikistan. Uh, I mean, I know a little bit about Uzbekistan, but yeah, it, w it was a new new territory for me. So I have been doing quite a bit of research. So so what, what drew you to Tajikistan initially? Yeah, for me, it, it was like, you know, lots of other people. Uh, it was a name I've heard before, but I couldn't really place it. Um, but I did travel quite a bit already. This is like 20 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I traveled more than I was uh, home, just, you know, backpacking. And um, 
And in 2005, I traveled to uh, India and I was also planning to go to Pakistan and the Karakoramai uh, into China. And that passed the Tajikistan quite closely. And I was trekking up Mustagata with my, uh, my wife. And we peered into the country of Tajikistan and it seemed like forbidden land. You know, uh, it was like this vast plain with nothingness, and snow-capped mountains and everything is high. So, um, yeah, that got me, that got me interested. And uh, so I uh, basically did, you know, I like looking at maps. I looked at a map and I was sold. Like, you know, if you look at a map and the relief map, especially it's, it's mountains only. And, uh, so yeah, I was uh, digging a little bit deeper and then my wife got a job uh, that took her to Tajikistan and I thought, okay, let's make that a holiday as well. So a uh, working trip and a holiday and we went cycling there. Um, mm. And it struck me that, you know, we did some research for, uh, for hiking, but there was no information out there, nothing. Um, only some old Russian maps, you know, the, the topographical maps that were produced in the late 80s, early 90s. Other than that, nothing, you know, it's just satellite imaging. And, uh, and so, so we did some wild guesses where we could go hiking. And I thought, wow, you know, we found some real, really cool trails that were not mapped at all. And I thought, this is, this is it. This is something I have to do with. Uh, um, and the, the, yeah, that's when the idea of, of uh, writing a guidebook was born. You know, without any plan, I thought, wow, people need to know about this. So uh, this was back in 2009. What was the experience like? You know, if that's obviously a foreign land, not many tourists, I can imagine it's, you know, it's so far from westernization. How, how did you feel on that trail? And what were your experiences with the, the local communities and such? Yeah, so we were cycling at the time and... People are so welcoming. I mean, um, it's quite often hard to find accommodation. There is a, a network of uh, homestays, but they're often quite hard to find. Um, so at the end of the day, sometimes we would be stranded and people would just uh, come out to us and, uh, and offer us uh, a bed and a uh, you know, warm meal and everything. So yeah, yeah. it's incredible how wel welcoming um, the, the people in the Pamirs, in the whole of Tajikistan actually are. Uh, and that also drew me back. You know, it's not just the mountains, but also the the, the feeling that people give you, uh, the welcoming feeling that people give you. you know, you're, it's like, yeah, it's it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, for the the locals, it must be quite surprising to see such a, a Western, you know, kind of intrigue and you know so how's that how's that been how's it been received by the, the people of Tajikistan or are you are, are we bringing more tourists over there are we getting more people involved in that as how, how well has your book been received well the book has been received very well but by not so many people <laughs> you know it's still <laughs> it's still quite it's still quite niche uh yeah. as you can imagine I mean the the Cicero guidebooks to the Lake District, they sell quite a bit better than mine. <laughs> but, you know, I knew that, Cicero knew that. Uh, it's not really about the numbers, it's more about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just pioneer, a pioneering title that, um, yeah, that gives gives people different ideas. You know, it's not just, uh, Cicero is not just about uh, walking in the UK, but also further afield. Um, and how has that influenced uh, Vista numbers? Well, I'm, I'm sure it inspires people to go. People who come across it, you know, so people will have, you know, gotten the idea to go to Tajikistan. Um, Tajikistan has, has made it a lot easier to get a visa. So from having to go to an embassy uh, in the capital or even further, you know, they introduce an e-visa system, which makes it a lot okay. easier to visit. Uh, I think that was definitely a game changer uh, for a lot of yeah. people. So the the boundary has, you know, the bar has been lowered um, to actually visit. Um, what is the route for, for, for Westerners, you know, maybe in Europe, for example, that, that would want to go to Tajikistan? How do we get there? Most people fly Turkish Airlines, so uh, okay. that, that's the best connection via Istanbul. So the most efficient uh, connection. 
and another route is via with uh, Fly Dubai. So, so Emirates okay. Fly Dubai uh, can get there as quite easily as well. Yeah, yeah, because it, it, it's I mean the trail that you're mapping out the the Pamir Trail, what is it a thousand kilometers? That's yeah, it's fairly lengthy, isn't it? It's not, it's, it's yeah, much more than we're, we're where I'm used to in Scotland for, for for sure. I mean, the longest I think I've done is a hundred miles, let, let alone a thousand. So, yeah, how did that come together? I mean, it's mammoth. Yeah, it is. Well, <clears throat> obviously, because um, I was doing research for tracking it, particularly stuff for the book, um, I visited a place in the, the north. The northern ranges, as I call them. So, um, and so as I see it, you, Tajikistan has two big mountain areas. It's the north, everything north of Kishambe, uh, that borders Kyrgyzstan. And then you've got the Pamirs, which kind of uh, is the eastern part of the country that all goes from also Kyrgyzstan all the way to Afghanistan and it borders China as well. So, that's a massive, uh, it's half the country essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered there were a lot of connections between valleys, between uh, between places. Everything, not everything, but lots of places are connected. Um, some more obvious than others, but uh, yeah, shepherds have, have been there for, for centuries, right? And, and, and they take their uh, livestock from one valley to the other, and they use the, the big mountain passes for that. So um, I already had, we already had mapped out like 40% uh, off the trail through that research. And then I thought, wow, you know, I, there was a lockdown, obviously. And I, it was something I had in mind for a very long time already. And, but now's the time to kind of start getting serious about it. Uh, you know, plotting routes, routes on the map and plan a trip when the country would open again. So, yeah. So, so do, you ha do you have the, the full thousand kilometers mapped out or, or is it still in progress? There's actually people mapping it uh, this this summer. Uh, I've got a lot of people helping out. Uh, just people like you come across the the, the website, the, the, yeah. you know, Pamir Trail idea, and they reach out and say, "Okay, we want to help." Dude, is there still some stuff to do? So uh, currently, we had a breakthrough in the north, so we've got now 51 stages stitched up, and now it's really like some crux uh, passes in the years that that need to be mapped yeah. out and it's quite hard because the, the terrain is unforgiving i think at the moment we're at 85 percent uh to 90 percent so oh, it's oh, really oh. the final final bits that need to, be, need to be done it might be finished this year by a couple of teams but um i think next year i need to come back to finish the the job so that's <laughs> um yeah. Which, which I don't mind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it does sound a bit like a passion project. So, I mean, you talked about the terrain being quite tough. I mean, I assume this isn't a trek for beginners, or, or is it? Maybe tell us a bit more about the, the, you know, what you've mapped out so far, and maybe take us through some some of that journey and what to expect. Yeah, so, so some places are more developed than others and have like uh, good trails. So if, if you would do the through hike when it's finished, obviously mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's a massive undertaking no matter what. Yeah. You know, even if you are an experienced tracker, it's um, you know there's so much elevation gain. It's hard terrain in some places. Also, route finding is is an issue, uh, food planning and all that. But yeah. if you do sections, there's actually like the first section in the Fan Mountains, which is uh, bordering Uzbekistan. It's in the, okay. the northeast of uh, Tajikistan. It's actually very doable. Uh, it's quite well developed around there. It's, I, I would say, the most developed part of, uh, of the Tajik Mountains for uh, hiking tourism. So, yeah, it's actually for if, you, if people are interested in doing sections, uh, let's say two weeks uh, max, then... You know, there are places that are very accessible uh, also for beginning hikers, I would say. Yeah. yeah, so are there plenty of villages then or town townships or, or, or even cities are, are along the way? Or, I mean, how how, how far flung into the wilderness are, are you when you when you go on that hike? Because, you know, it must take a, a fair amount of planning for water and, and foods. Because uh, from the research that I've done, it, it didn't seem that there was a lot of natural water resources along the way or or is that wrong 
there's actually a lot of water. You just you, you have to fill you have to filter it or, or purify it. But uh, okay, yeah, there's the, I mean there there's a lot of water. Water is not not the problem really. It's uh, food is you know food supplies. Uh, is challenging because yes, there are sometimes villages, but they don't have shops because there's uh, sort of yeah. um, self-supporting. Uh-huh. Well, you know, they live live off the land, they live off the livestock and the and the, and the vegetables they grow. So they, they technically, they the you know, they maybe they would sell you something, but uh-huh. you cannot rely on it. You know, so yes, uh, you probably need a few f- food drops here and there. Uh, um, some some places are. Uh, more inhabited than, than others. I mean, some places are actually have quite a big density of uh, villages and basically every other day you can resupply. But the further you go northeast and, and to the central part, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard. Uh, yeah. You need to plan it well. You need to bring six, seven day worth of food. Uh, otherwise, uh, you may run out. So I, do, I, I used to do it with freeze-dried food. It's obviously, that's... Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, good. Very pack, very packable. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so as part of your plotting of the the legs or or the journeys, are, are you for people that would be interested in in undertaking sections of it or or entirely? Would your guides and planning show where some of these potential food stops or food drops or villages and stuff are or? Or not. Uh, we 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 show where the homestays are. Uh, homestays, for now, yeah. we 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 still need to need to kind of uh, yeah add sort of a, a food drop strategy. We started with with a very scattered route, so it wasn't mm-hmm. really applicable yet. But we now came to the point where we really need to advise on uh, how you can restock. You know, if there's people who can assist you with that, like local companies or. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's definitely something we need to uh, work on after um, after this summer when lots of root sections have been stitched up and um, and basically people yeah pe- people need to be able to plan it properly. So uh, yeah, yeah. And what about the, the kind of culture, or the cultures and communities and, and language that you're going to come across? What is it? Did it to the because do you come across? Is it Russian? Because I. What what kind of languages and cultures are, are actually in that in, in Tajikistan, or is it? Because I've learned that I've heard of the di- the Tajik dialect, but I'm not, I was I couldn't really figure out which language was was spoken widely in the country, or whether it was Arabic or. No, it's um, uh, the, the official language, the main language, I guess, is Tajik, which is a, um, a, a dialect of Farsi. Uh, I mean, it's it's a Farsi based language, um, but then. Yeah, the, the older generation still speaks uh, quite a bit of Russian, obviously. Uh, yeah. You know, just... Okay. So, but that that is dying out, I would say, a little bit. It's not everywhere spoken anymore. And I think the youth prefers to speak English. Uh, it's, it's my oh, experience. okay. So, so English is spoken then, or at least... Yeah, it's a, the, the younger generation uh, speaks speaks English quite well, yeah. And then you've got in the Pamirs, they've got their local languages uh, that are not necessarily written languages. So, uh-huh. yeah, every valley, yeah, like uh, Shugnani or, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a, a spoken language. And uh, they may speak some Russian, they may speak some Tajik, but sometimes they only speak that Pamiri language. So, yeah, it's kind of... Yeah, you need other ways to communicate. So, so ha- have you actually done the trail, the eighty-five percent yourself, or have you just done sections of it? How much? How, how much mileage have you covered in the premieres yourself? Yeah, I think I've done sixty uh, percent so far myself. Um, I've been in most areas, but I haven't yeah. walked it precisely every trail because you know some some trail sections were not suitable or. Um, but I've got a lot of help of people. There's a Canadian guy, Christy Bloyer. He did a lot of legwork in uh, the north of Tajikistan, especially because, huh? uh, yeah, he's very passionate as well. He's, he's part of the team and he's, uh, yeah, he's there now. He made a breakthrough for one of the major crux traverses from the north back to the, the Pamirs. So, um, yeah, without that help, it would have, it would take a lot longer. It's, um, it's, yeah, it's it's crucial that people help out and yeah, um, 
and see what is possible right and uh, yeah. maybe one day i'm gonna walk it all the way all the way myself but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know okay good i, I mean you touched the, earlier on the terrain what, what i mean because it's quite a high elevation as well isn't it tajikistan so what, what do, do you ever have any do you, is there ever any need for sort of mountaineering type skills or is it is is it just an arduous hike you know what types of you know, terrain are, are you encountering and what types of mount, mount, mountain terrain are you coming across and, you know, are, are there climates and weather patterns that you need to be aware of? Is it, what's because I've seen planes of it that looked quite open and quite exposed to what I would imagine would be high winds and stuff. So can you maybe just talk us through a little bit about that and your experiences of the, the terrain and the weather? Yeah, that's exactly it. So there's quite a variety in terrain. Um, uh, the, the lower valleys uh, often have big rivers from meltwater, you know, from higher up. Uh, it's quite hot in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, even at like 2,000, 2,500 meters, it's still baking hot. So if, once you pass the 3,000 meters, it's, it's uh, a lot more pleasant to, to, to hike in daytime. Uh, Terrain-wise, sometimes there's good trails, like proper trails, not too steep. Um, like the Pamirs in the, in the south, you know, there's not, not really steep terrain. It's more like a uh, high altitude plains where it's quite easy hiking. Whereas in the Fan Mountains, uh, the passes are super steep. Like it's a very compact, dense mountain area. So it's, uh, yeah, it's lots of up and down. Um, rivers are generally uh, one of the, the big issues, like geographical issues you need to be aware of when you, mm -hmm. when you, uh, when you plan your day. Um, because in some places there are no bridges, you know, you kind of have to cross the river, uh, you have to go through the river, you wait. Um, so you need to plan your camp basically next to the river and cross first thing in the morning. Yeah. Otherwise it's impossible to cross. There's some glaciers you need to go on. Um, but we make sure that the glaciers are not mountaineer glaciers. So they should be quite flat. Um, yeah, you know, the aim is that it's for hikers and not for mountaineers. Otherwise, the yeah. the, the bar is too high for you know. Yeah, you get have a like... narrower, narrower market in doing that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, mm. uh, but yeah, you, you do, in some sections you do need to use you need to break crampons, uh, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to advise to bring an axe as well for some of the sections. But you can plan that, for mm. example, with a food drop that. You know, I mean, you, you will have to use a few drops also for equipment, I, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's high. It's uh, this, I mean, it goes many passes between 4,500 and 5,000 meters. So, you know, okay, it's, uh, so... that's yeah. serious. Yeah. Wind, have, you, have, you had, have you had any difficulties on it yourself? You had any difficult situations or scary situations doing it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, when you do reckeys, you know, you, you think something might be possible and it wasn't. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, I, I, I checked, uh, the, there's the Hissar Ranch, it's quite close to the capital of Bishambe, uh, and I decided to go on trail runners uh, because I looked at the trail and I thought, okay, you know, that's, that, that's possible. And um, it was all fine up to 300 meters before the pass and it was just... Six, I don't know, 50, 60 degrees scree slope, you know, mm -hmm. where it's all loose. And yeah. Uh, and yeah, I made it through, but, you know, I didn't have like proper shoes to to, uh, to carve in, uh, in the slope. And yeah, that was a bit, uh, I thought, okay, maybe this was not the best idea. But yeah, and sometimes, I mean, dogs are an issue, can be an issue as well. Uh, the, she the, sh the shepherd dogs uh, can be quite vicious. Okay. Uh, in in uh, the Tajik Mountains, especially in the like the yeah the Sand Mountains and the, yeah they are. I mean, they they they're guarding the shepherd camps, but you know you should not come too close. I've had an encounter <laughs> where three dogs were surrounding me. I was alone, and I thought, you know, if one goes goes for it, then I'm I'm done. That would tear me apart. So uh, yeah. yeah, I've had a few encounters that were not, you know, yeah, I, I, I was <laughs> lucky to uh, come out un unharmed. <laughs> Can I ask a favor? 
If you're enjoying the show, can you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel on YouTube? And if you happen to be listening to the audio-only version, can you give us a follow along there too? It'll really help grow the channel. We've got some fantastic guests coming up with some truly inspirational stories. Now, let's get back to this episode. Thank you. You bring up an interesting topic. Yeah. So, so what kind of wildlife are you encountering? Is it wild dogs or do you have any threat of bears or or anything like that? Well, up to now, I thought bears were not an issue, but I, I heard from another um, Tajikistan enthusiast uh, who was basically sort of half attacked by a bear in her tent. Um, so the, the bear got away, but, uh, you know, so I thought always that the, the shepherds were exaggerating when they were talking about bears, but, you know, they are, yeah, they, evidently they are, <laughs> they can be an issue. <laughs> uh, there are wolves, but wolves are not so much of a problem, I think, it's, you know, they have enough to munch on in the uh, summertime, so, you know, they necessarily, uh, so you, uh, yeah, wolves and bears are, are the, the big, like, that's the big wildlife that, you know, you kind of have to keep in mind, snow leopards, you know, you'd be lucky to be mauled by a snow leopard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean they're very, very elusive. very small chance. Yeah, they're, they're extremely elusive. I, think, I mean, for, for me, that probably adds a little bit of glamour to it, to the, you know, wildlife encounters and actually the opportunity to see something like that along, along the trail as opposed to seeing that as a, as a negative. So that, that's quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of rolling back a little bit, I mean, just there was a question I wanted to ask around the, the terrain. You talked about the rivers and maybe the, you know, the, the crossing of the, of the water. Is there, is there any point you need to have maybe like a pack raft or some sort of man-made raft to cross that? Or or, or is that just about forward planning and, and watching water levels at certain times of the day? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, through hikers would not just uh, bring along a pack raft, you know, that's kind of unrealistic. Um, I've been thinking about bringing one myself just as a tool for uh, for wrecking uh, various route options. Uh, there's actually a uh-huh. couple, American couple who got in touch. They, they're going to uh, check some places uh, with a pack raft. So, um, uh-huh. yeah, no, I, uh, I would love to bring a pack raft, but it's, yeah, it's... Yeah, but we, we're looking for river crossings for places to cross the river where you don't need such a thing. You might need a rope. Yeah. You know, I always advise people to bring like a small eight millimeter rope, like 30 meters or 20 meters. So, oh, you know, good. you have at least some something to, uh, um, yeah, to hold on to, especially when you're with a couple of people, you know, you may be able to uh, make it easier to cross. Other than that, no, it's just timing. Timing is everything. Yeah, so so do you have a recommended kit list then as part of your 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 kind of pl- uh, planning that people should bring? I think you touched on maybe like crampons, maybe a, an ice axe or pick. Do you have other recommendations or? Well, yeah, t- 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 nights are cold, eh? um, so always bring your down jacket. It's also for a camp because uh, it can be can be. Uh, in daytime is nice and balmy, and then at night, you know, the moment mm-hmm. the, the sun goes disappears behind the mountains uh, it's suddenly it's it's like zero degrees uh and with a little bit of wind it's it's icy cold uh obviously for you know for through hikers uh super light tent i wouldn't necessarily pv i mean you can you know let's just bring a just a tarp but uh yeah yeah it's pretty hardcore i would say in tajikistan because you're quite exposed to the elements um I would always bring hike, hiking poles are quite crucial for river crossings. Uh, if you twist an ankle, you know, it's just, I, I always think that's essential rather than optional uh, mm-hmm. to bring. Um, plenty of sunscreen because the sun is absolutely brutal out there. <sighs> um, yeah, so, but that's a tricky thing because in daytime it's really nice. You know, you can walk around in t shirt and shorts, whereas it, in the evening you really need yeah. to kind of. Very different at night. Uh, so, what 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 yeah. season do, do, what season do you recommend, or, or do, does your plan have, or do you have a plan for each each season, or, or what would you recommend? Yeah, so I recommend for people to start in the northeast, uh, sorry, the northwest of Tajikistan. So that, that's where the Pamir Trail starts near a place called okay. Kenjikant, uh, and that's because the passes are snow free already in uh, June. 
so you can just cross the passes without any trouble. And most places there are bridges as well. Um, and then as you go along, you know, other passes may get snow free. And in July, you know, in the Pamirs, sometimes you've got a pack of snow still in mid July. So yeah, it's, it's a bit hard. If there's a lot of snowfall, then it takes a long time for it to, um, to melt. But, uh, but yeah, I would say for the, for the first parts, uh, June is probably the best time. So the, the first two sections, the Northwest and the North, and then for the Pamirs from half July, uh, until September, I would say end of September, you can, uh, yeah, you can, that's the best time for trekking there. Yeah. Excellent. So in terms of the, the trail and the sections, if, if someone was to complete most of it or all of it, what, what you know, where, where do they, where do they finish in Tajikistan? What, what is the, the destination and, and what is transport links like? You know, how do people get back to, to, to civilization? <laughs> yeah. So actually where you end, that's in the Waha corridor. So that's, uh, ah. I, I hiked it with a, a Dutch group as an expedition leader last year. So we basically tried out with a commercial trip to uh, to hike two sections of the Pamir Trail, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was successful. It was tough, you know. Um, especially the last pass is also the highest, the Frank Pass. It's five thousand meters. But when you come down, you end in a valley with lots of villages. Um, public transport is a bit hard, so you probably need to arrange private transport if you want to move quickly. If you have time, mm -hmm. then you just wait for a lift, or you. Uh, can take one of those uh, small vans like Mashutkas uh, that take people to the main town in the Pamir Skorog. And from there, mm -hmm. you can uh, take direct like shared taxis or private taxis straight to uh, Dushanbe. So it's actually uh, pretty accessible uh, if you look at it. It takes time. I mean, it's a couple of days traveling back to Dushanbe, but uh, uh, because mm -hmm. the roads are, uh, you know, not always in the best condition. But uh, <laughs> and anything can yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And, and so, so traveling through Tajikistan, what, what, you know, recommendations or you know, how safe is it for 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 Westerners that have never been there or maybe apprehensive? What, what's your experiences of that, and what would you what would you say to that? So it's a it's a pretty safe place, I would say. Uh, you know, people are always a bit wary because it borders Afghanistan, but mm -hmm. you know, it's. Uh, yeah, there's there's a big river in between. The, there's this, you know, they're not at war or anything. I mean, it's uh, yes, the, the things happen in Afghanistan, but also tourists these days go to Afghanistan. So, you know, yeah. um, and in terms of domestically, yeah, things have happened. Uh, there's there's been unrest in the Pamirs, and there's still some unrest lingering. Uh, mm -hmm. It's often quite localized, but you know, when you're in the mountains, you wouldn't wouldn't encounter that. Uh, uh, but there's always a chance, of course, that something flares up. But there's many countries where it's yeah. like that, you know. I mean, uh, so yeah, it, it's not a reason for people not to go. I would say uh, yeah, just I, stay informed, I you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I I agree. I agree. It's like it's, I mean, things can happen anywhere in the world, so it's not a reason not to go just because it's so far off and so remote. I think that's part of the allure and part of the attraction to to, to these places. Isn't it? You know, you're so yeah. you're so far off the beaten track. The the interactions with the locals, uh, yeah, I and mean, it does. It yeah, sounds exactly. phenomenal. Yeah, I I seen some of your some of the pictures and stuff that you shared on it. The, the lakes, the water, yeah, it's some of the snow capped mountains. I mean, it it does look fantastic. It, it really does. I don't know when I'll get the chance to even sample a section of it, but it, it, it does. I mean, it is that that was the reason that I kind of reached out when I was doing some research. It, it, it really it is quite alluring. So it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very special place. Yeah, good. So, I, I mean, in in terms of you going back and completing the the rest of the trail, what what would be next for, for Jan? Do you have other trails and other? Other plans to explore the region or maybe further afield? Yeah, so the, the, the idea is um, in 2016, I met the, the guy who created the, the Great Himalaya Trail, uh, GHT. Okay. Um, and we talked about this already. At, at the time, I wasn't working on any primary trail, but I was just, we were just kind of 
uh, envisioning how these trails would meet up because as the crow flies, the, you know, it officially ends in Pakistan. So it would be like only two or 300 kilometers uh, extra mm-hmm. to kind of connect these trails. Um, I've done the Pamir part. So the Pamir trail ends at the border of Afghanistan, but there's a trail going into Afghanistan. Only you have to cross into the country in a different place. Yeah, that connects to Pakistan. I had a friend. I have a friend who uh, who crossed the Hindu Kush to the Karakoram. So we're mm-hmm. pretty far already, uh, mm-hmm. but it would be fantastic if we can link all these trails together into yeah. one massive, mm-hmm. greater mm-hmm. range of trail. So, uh, but that's not really. I mean, uh, I'm going to move back to Scotland uh, probably in three or four years time. Um, and that's in the Northwest and there's a lot of opportunity for pack rafting trails. So, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. that's one of the things I'm going to start checking. I already have some ideas. Maybe I'm opening some pack rafting trails, uh, the Northwest. Uh Um, we, uh, we are co-owners of, uh, an eco camp in Eastern Uganda, uh, with a beautiful mountain that needs trail development. Uh, so that's that. That's another project uh, I'm working on, and um, uh, yeah, and I, also in Africa, there's lots to do. Uh, there's lots of mountains oh, yeah, to climb. Yeah. So, uh, so what, what actually? What, uh, what took you to Uganda? I mean, that that's a story in itself. What, how did you end up there in Kampala? Well, um, in 2017, I visited uh, Uganda as a tourist with my sister. We climbed the highest peak, Margarita Peak. That's just over okay. 5,000 meters. Yeah, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. You know, it's just uh, like a wild mountain range that not many people visit. Glaciers on the equator, uh, and even in, in Kampala, where I stayed, you know, this guy he lived in a nice house with a massive garden. And at the time, we lived in Lebanon uh, on the eleventh floor, somewhere in Beirut, <laughs> and we just had our second baby. Wow! Uh, so <laughs> I came back from this trip, and I said to my wife. Uh, because she's an in international development. Um, okay. And, you know, but basically we, we, we are going wherever she can find uh, employment. And yeah. I said, you need to find a job in Uganda. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, excellent. And within two years, we moved here. So there was yeah. a bit of luck as well. Uh, wow. uh, so, yeah, it's basically we ended here because uh, my wife, uh, you know, has a, has a job in uh, international development and I, if I could do something as well locally, and uh, yeah, there's yeah. always projects for me to do. So, uh, yeah. What is the project you're involved with in Uganda? I, I mean, I did see you post some stuff on LinkedIn that I was kind of having a look at, but if you could tell us a little bit about that, that would be that'd be good. Yeah. So, um, it's a, I was there only for two months, and then I was approached to join the uh, project called Adventure Tourism Uganda. Uh, they were mm-hmm. applying for funding, and I would be involved in the hiking part of the, of yeah. the project. Uh, they received the funding and then uh, basically we um, yeah it's it's putting uh, hiking tourism in Uganda on the sort of international map and also do a bit of uh, uh, capacity building so training guides training cooks uh, tour operators how to uh, reach the audience better and uh, yeah. basically how to raise the quality of, of the trackings because it's so yeah, un- underdeveloped actually. You know, there's hardly any people doing it, so this, the uh-huh. experiences all- levels are also quite low. And uh, so we're, we're trying to crank that up, get more visitors, uh, get them well trained, and basically get a si- an upward cycle of, uh, of of trips that get better and better. People talk about it, and yeah, and get get more people to sort of the, the unknown regions in East Africa. Yeah. If everybody goes to Kilimanjaro, but you know, yeah. you go to Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. So are, are you actually trying to establish some trails and, and hikes yourself out there with the team? Yeah. Yes. So um, privately, I, I, I brought myself into uh, an uh, eco camp, uh, bush camp uh, in the mm-hmm. east, close to the border with Kenya. There's an amazing mountain. It's called Mount Kadam. Uh, it's, it goes from 1,500 meters to 3,000 and has like indigenous forests, like a, a proper jungle. Uh, yeah steep rock faces um, and there's on that side of the mountain there are no trails uh, and on mm-hmm. the other side there's a wildlife reserve with cheetahs and, and, and uh, you know just all kinds of wildlife <laughs> and bird life 
So you're mm. in between an outdoor, like a wildlife reserve and an outdoor paradise. Um, and right in the middle, we managed to get land, uh, to develop a little bit of land to put a, a push camp. Uh-huh. So yeah, we're uh, in the process of applying for some funding and, uh, and trying to get like the we need to make it ready for tourists. Uh, yeah. Hopefully in October, that will be uh, ready. And I will go there to develop trails with the local communities and uh, see if we can uh, get some interesting multi-day tracks and maybe camp out in the communities. And I, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a unique place. Uh, it's, yeah. You know, if you like pioneering yes. stuff, then, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, 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 yeah. that's the place to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think I'll, I, when we wrap up, I think I'll go and do a little bit more digging and, and review of that. It sounds, it sounds, it sounds awesome. Actually, you know, so close to some of the. I mean, if there's undiscovered, you know, uh, areas there, and you can blaze a trail and create, a, you know, a, a, some sort of hike uh, and map that out, so close to some of that wildlife, and 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 you know, bring more tourism to Uganda. That's that's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So. That, so, so kind of coming back to to the P- Premier Trails because I, I took us off on a tangent there back back to Uganda. Just how can listeners and viewers get involved with the Premier Trail? Is it is there anything you can do to help with that whilst it's still being established to raise awareness or contribute to that as a as a project? Yeah, we we, we are still mapping out parts of the trail. Uh, there are people mm-hmm. already out there who um, yeah who are helping out, but we're not finished yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always cool if people, you know, either do new sections or try out sections that we think are already done. So maybe mm-hmm. we're wrong. You know, it's, I mean, that people need to use it to, we need user experience, uh, like reviews yeah. to see if, okay. uh, if we've done the right thing. Um, yeah. And I think once the, the trail is finished, we, we go into the second phase, uh, that will also be capacity building. So we're going to train uh hosts guides okay. cooks uh, and everything especially in the parts that don't see many tourists mm-hmm. um so if there's any people listening out there who might be able to help that's of course more than welcome yeah. um and the website is not bad at the moment but i can you know i can see once we finish and when we have all the the trail beta and yeah, we probably need to upgrade to um, a website that's a bit more um, comprehensive, but also more, yeah, it's just yeah. Uh, more customized, uh, if you will. Yeah. You know, there's stuff that I cannot build myself um, because I, it's not my background. So, uh, you know, people can build a, like a proper website um, with all the features that it needs. Yeah, do you have a vision for getting the data into t- any sort of applications or trail apps or anything like that? GPS? Yes, I, I do want to work with uh, the the likes of Komoot um, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's just uh, sort of the, the trail apps. But yeah. you have said that there's hardly any data on co- a country like Tajikistan. Eh? The, yeah. the maps are pretty bare. Yeah. So I think we need to kind of do that ourselves. Um, okay. You know, it's just develop those maps ourselves and um, um a pretty old school guy you know i like to work with like nice topographical maps that yeah. <laughs> are static if you will uh, but yeah. I, I do use these apps as well uh myself sometimes so uh, yeah i see the yeah. need for it but we need to kind of figure out what what is feasible i mean yeah you can spend as much money as you want on a, on a website right <laughs> so yeah, it's stay realistic. But yeah, I mean, it's it's okay for now, I think. Um, yeah, good, but it, good. Yeah, I, I suppose old we'll school see. topical map, uh, you know, topography maps and stuff. That that's part of the adventure, isn't it? You know, the the compass and the pencil and the the, the wonder and the scratching the head and you know, <laughs> and figuring it out. That's all part of the part of the adventure. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> laminating all these these, uh, these copies. <laughs> that, that's what I used to do. <laughs> yeah, re- redrawing and, and reinventing the, the, the maps was part of the fun, no doubt. Yeah. Good, yeah. good, good. Uh, well, well, thank you. I think we're coming up, coming up to the end. Uh, you know, thanks for taking us through uh, some of Tajikistan, the Premier Trail. It sounds exciting. You know, I, I really wish uh, you all the best, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how how that develops. And I and I would love to try and get involved in that at, at some point in the future. So, but 
uh, in terms of kind of closing tradition, really on the show, I wanted to kind of prompt two things, really. So, uh, you know, call to adventure. So, a recommendation from yourself for a project, which you can probably guess what it will be, but a project or an activity to to to, to raise awareness and, get, and kind of get uh, people uh, involved and inspired by. So, what have you got, Jan? <laughs> yeah, of course, Uganda. I mean. Uh... Apart from Pamir Trail, because we've talked about it, but yeah, yeah. Uganda, we talked about it as well, but it's uh, it's an incredible country and it has, I think, you know, if you compare it to uh, Kenya and Tanzania, that get, gets all the attention. It has so much variety of landscapes, uh, you know, for trekking, you can go to a proper mountain range rather than climbing up a volcano, which mm-hmm. is quite unique. Um, and it's unique. Like, there's landscapes you will never see. You never see anywhere else. Like, a glacier on the equator with the vegetation mm-hmm. and it's just um yeah it's i think uganda is some a place that if you if you love adventure but not just hiking you know you can mm-hmm. do all kinds of stuff you can go gravel biking here I, I take my gravel bike twice a week out here to uh to go riding on the african red dirt roads uh of course Kayaking is world class here in Jinja on the Nile. Yeah. It's you know uh, if you're a kayaker, you you will know. Yeah, uh, yep. yeah. So you know, in the small country, you can do pretty much almost everything you know, if it comes to uh, essential sports. So uh, oh, excellent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll I'll dive into that afterwards. We'll, we'll put some stuff in the show notes. I'll try and get some imagery and stuff to 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 bring that to life as well and get that on the site. So yeah, that that's so thank you. And then finally, just the, the last thing is to pay it forward. So you've given us a bit of an adventure, a place to come, but is it, are, are there any other you know, worthy causes or, or charitable projects or anything you want to sp- spread awareness of other than uh, the likes of the Pamir Trail or, or Uganda? Yeah, well, actually, this touching some related. There's a project that uh, supports women to become hiking guides in, uh, in the Pamirs. Uh, the, per- the project is called Women Rockin' Pamirs. Um, mm-hmm. If you go to Women Rockin' Pamirs, uh, mm-hmm. so it's rockin' without the G at the end. Okay. Uh, dot org. Um, you can, I mean, they, they train up uh, young women to become uh, uh, yeah, pro- hiking guides uh, okay. in a sort of a male dominated uh, uh, industry. It's quite a, a breath of fresh air, really. To, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that that's a worthy cause to uh, support. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'll go and have a look at that as well and get the, the details and get that published and and let's uh, spread spread some awareness on that. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's been excellent. That's been a journey in itself. Yeah, you, you've got me, yeah. my you've got my my thoughts going to to both Tajikistan and Uganda. So that's the rest of my evening on YouTube, planned out. <laughs> so 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 thank you. So I think that that brings the, the show to a close. 